third. Should we start already? Good morning. We are here. We are here to introduce Tim Sherry, who was a former teacher and principal. Actually, I just found out in District Riot in Bethel District, and uh, he has written three three books of poetry. Was that after your retirement? You wrote the books of poetry. And uh, one of the books that he wants to share with us today about some of the poems from the book are called Holy Ghost Town, and it's about Holden Village, where many of us went. I first heard Tim present with several people here. I heard Tim present his poetry at St. Mark's Lutheran Church, and that must have been right after the book was published, it sounds like, because it was all pre-pandemic. So anyway, we are here to introduce Tim and share some of this poetry. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and if, if you're worried about the number of people here, um, this is not unusual. <laughs> I read at the University of Washington bookstore uh, for my first book. And besides Marsha, my wife, and me, there were four other people. <laughs> so it's not unusual. Um, I put on your chair a couple of items. Uh, and I'm not sure how long I should plan. Somebody logged on, but they're very gray. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how long I should go, maybe until what, 1030? That's late as 1045. Yeah. 1045, okay. Um, I, I will do that. And um, at the end, I will invite you to uh, request from the list of poems that you see on the sheet on your, on your chair. Um, and a little bit more about myself. Um, yes, I was a school teacher and a high school principal for many years. And when you do that, and when you're tall, and when you were a fairly well-known athlete, uh, you don't write poetry. <laughs> Can you imagine your vice principal <clears throat> kicking you out of school and you're a poet? <clears throat> so I, I kept my light under a bushel for many, many years. And then when I retired, um, I had written quite a bit uh, over the years, but never told anybody. So when I retired, I decided, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. And I was 62 years old at the time. And I, I want to present myself as an example that it's never too late. Uh, if you have a passion, if you have something that you really wanted to do all your life and never did, then uh, go for it. <clears throat> and interestingly, um, how did I get started? I got started by going to poetry readings. How many of you have been to a poetry reading? Okay. Um, how many of you read poetry regularly? Okay, good. Um, I ask that because it will kind of tell me how to, how to present what I'm going to do. Um, I, I decided after I retired as a high school principal, um, I had visions of glory that I could still teach in the classroom. Well, I got a job at Gig Harbor High School uh, right after I retired. And it was the hardest year of my life. And part of the reason that I'm here is that right next door to me was a very well-known Northwest poet named Derek Sheffield. 
and you may know that name, and he was a protege of Kevin Miller, who was at Gig Harbor High School for a very long time and nurtured lots and lots of poets. And so that's why I'm here, because Derek Sheffield said, hmm, uh, you, you have potential, which is maybe a nice way of saying stop. <laughs> I, I took it literally. <clears throat> and I, I started to write and got connected with uh, the Poetry Network in Tacoma and at Tacoma Community College and lots of other places in the area. And they were all very, very helpful and very encouraging. And then I was able to publish uh, several things from about 2005 to 2008 or 9, and those were in journals. And then Marcia and I, who had been to Holden many, many times, starting in 1967, um, but hadn't been for two decades, we decided that we would go back to Holden in 2009 and volunteer. Have any of you done that? Volunteered to work at Holden, okay. And while I was there, I said, okay, uh, I'm gonna write a poem every day. And I did. So by the time we were done, I had probably 15 poems about Holden Village. And now what do you do with poems about Holden Village? <clears throat> because the poetry community in the world and in the United States is not very interested at all. In fact, more or less against religious poetry, especially Christian poetry. But I was bound and determined to think of what I had done as a possible book. And over the next several years after 2009, I continued to write Holden poems because we would go back to Holden and I'd say, okay, I'm gonna write some more poems about Holden Village. <clears throat> and by the time 2017 rolled around, I had what I would consider a manuscript, which is what you have uh, in front of you. And uh, I couldn't find anybody. Nobody wanted to publish that. And finally, I found a press in Alaska, Cirque Press. And they said they would publish it, and lo and behold, I have a book that I knew I had an audience. All of the Lutheran churches in the world and around here, I knew I had an audience. And I thank you very much for coming and being here and supporting what, I, what I've done. Um, <clears throat> how many of you do not know anything about it? Is there anybody here who doesn't know anything about it? How it came about, the big mine up there for copper. Copper, copper comes down to the smelter in Tacoma. They leave the mine in 1957. It's just walked away, left everything. Um, and it was a ghost town for a couple of years. And then it was discovered by Wes Preeb, a kid at Lutheran Bible Institute. And he wrote letters to the mining company with the outrageous idea that they give the whole thing <laughs> to the Lutheran Bible Institute, which they did. The mine unloaded the whole operation, the mine, all of the equipment, the buildings, a hundred houses that housed Mary miners. They gave everything to the Lutheran Bible Institute. Yes? Wasn't there a great liability and all that? Absolutely. <laughs> but one thing you have to realize about Holden Village is that there's a great deal of serendipity involved and a great deal of whimsy and a great deal of making it up as you go. And that's what they did. The people from LBI went up there and took a look and said, oh, okay. And one thing led to another and it became the retreat center that it's been for the last 70 years. <clears throat> And so I tried to organize the book as a kind of narrative of when you go to hold it, when you decide you're gonna go to Chelan, park, get on the boat, go up Lake Chelan 25 miles, <clears throat> get off at Lucerne, 
get on an old school bus, ride up 11 miles into the middle of nowhere, get out of the school bus, and there you are. Because still at Holden Village, all of the mining stuff is gone. Still is all of the buildings, all of the things that the miners lived in. So bowling alley, gymnasium, uh, soda fountain, hospital, lodges for the single miners, houses for the staff, it's all still there. And I wanted to suggest by the things that I'm going to read, uh, what it's like to go there and be there and what Holden is all about. So the first poem that I'm gonna read is called Arrival. And keep in mind that you've just ridden a boat for an hour and a half to two hours. You've just gotten on a bus and ridden another 45 minutes and then you arrive, so arrival. There are still names for places in the road from decades ago when trucks rumbled ore to Lake Chelan. Today it's a reclaimed school bus up the switchbacks, through the narrows, onto the flat that means soon there. Words for wilderness speak from the seats. Pine, granite, peak, waterfall, bear. Then right at the road is a mile of burned trees. The driver explains to the rear view mirror how fire is the way the forest recedes itself. Did he say recedes? In the silence of awe, we give thanks that we weren't here the years the forest on fire took back. As the ride turns into just a ride for the last mile, we know either word means more than the driver is telling us. Isn't it why we came? We want to see the forest and the trees. We want new growth. We want a place where meaning is more than words. Finally, we round the last turn into the village where welcome waits underneath the waving. The driver stops, stands, and explains wilderness using sacred words, as if in prayer. Then he drives us ahead to our week of mountains. We step off, nervous at the applause and hyperbole shouted by those waiting to greet us. We wonder what kind of place is this, this old mining town that dug into the mountain and shipped its ore to the smelter in Tacoma where it melted into our abundant lives. Lives so in need of a fire we hope still burns low inside of us. When you get there, <clears throat> you begin to learn. There's an orientation that you go through uh, when you first arrive. I apologize for this, but this, this is who I am as far as <laughs> heat. <laughs> Um, and this kind of sums up um, the way it works at Holden Village. You're never alone, even though you can be as alone as you ever want to be. This is entitled Degrees of Separation. And the dining hall is one of the main parts of Holden Village. Food is a huge part of what goes on there. A first name and a smile sitting down starts the conversation. From where is next? Then it's 20 minutes of geography. In Jesus' time, it was easier, maybe three degrees separating the world around the Mediterranean, where villages the size of Holden were big places, and Rome was New York. Tonight, it's eight people at the table from all over the Bible, hoping to find someone who knows someone who reads parables the same as they. If not parables to connect them, then stories about someone who knows someone 
who went to the same school or traveled to the same place last summer. Everyone wants to know how long are you here, which leads to what brings you to hold. The last part of it separates the one at the end of the table who gets up to put his dishes away, to walk out into the evening and stand alone down by the river. The story to be told about him would have been parable had his name come up at Jesus' table. A great deal of what happens at Holden is that people go there um, to, as we used to say, find themselves. So you find a lot of young people there who aren't quite sure what comes next. <clears throat> they maybe are taking a gap year. Maybe they've had a terrible tragedy in their lives. But very often you find people there who are searching. So you're there, you have settled in, you've gotten your orientation, you've had lunch, uh, you've had the evening vespers, and now you go back to your room and there are no comforts of home. You've come to hold a knowing you will share a room, walk down the hall to men and women across from each other share a shower with 15 or 20 people. When you arrive at Lodge 2, room 5, you have to make up the bed yourself. Communal living doesn't describe you in your underwear forgetting to close the door the first night. <laughs> Asking the couple on the porch who have been here for two weeks is how, who you, how you know who is in room 11 with the crying baby. Your closet has wire hanger, hanging hangers from 1967. Asking someone for soap you forgot to bring from home isn't asking for charity, you are told. It's the New Testament. The woman in seven jokes when she gives you her extra bar. Suddenly awakened, you hear the young couple next door honeymooning at midnight. <laughs> You don't need the alarm clock you brought with the 5 a.m. four-year-old upstairs. But after a week of greetings every morning and good nights from new friends you've made, here, you don't need the four bedrooms and three baths back home. The buses are famous. There are about a half a dozen old school buses at the very beginning, they didn't know how to get people from the boat up to the village. And so they said, well, why don't we get some old school buses and use those? So I'm betting that there are school buses still there from 60 years ago. There are about a half a dozen of them and they all have names. The buses. Hilarity is part of Holden's core values, and buses are part of the laughter that is part of the story of Holden. Their names, Chelan, Jubilee, Intiot, North Star, Honey, Pookie, Took, all come from years of crawling guests up the switchbacks from the lake and then the slow half hour into the village. They needed names for the staff to decide whose turn it was each day to meet the fast boat and then the slow boat, who would need a few days off for repairs, who to park in the fall as the number of guests coming in needed just one bus. All still yellow from their school days, but covered in 11 miles of dirt road twice a day. The buses are Holden's way of starting guests off with a chuckle, that they are not back in elementary school, but they are on their way to a place where what is important in the wilderness is often as simple as the names of things. It might make one wonder that if there had been buses in Jesus' day, 
he might have called them James and John, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Peter, without a doubt, Thomas, and then send them out to pick anyone up wishing to get on. There are four sections in the book. The one is the first one is coming in, and those poems were from that section. The second section is called Look, Look, Look. And it's all about the beauty of Holden Village. And so these poems are from that section. The epigraph uh, at the start of that section, look, 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 is that God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but also on trees and in the flowers and clouds and stars. Martin Luther. The first poem is up early. Many, many people at Holden get up at five o'clock in the morning and you'll find um, probably a dozen or so people in the dining hall reading a book or <clears throat> writing in a journal. You'll see a lot of people who have started a walk and are out and back by the time breakfast starts at seven. So this poem is about that up early. City time goes on even without alarm clocks when light behind the mountains and bird song through the open window wake me. Lying quietly is no way to start a day at a church camp. And I decide a cup of coffee in the dining hall and a walk along the river. A different time goes on down from the glaciers, ahead where a deer drinks, over the mountains as the sun pinks the sky. What the clock says doesn't matter. The only one up isn't loneliness. This early doesn't need God yet. An hour of walking alone in the wilderness in such morning light around the next bend, I imagine myself at heaven's door. It's all about the mountains. There's a river, it's called Railroad Creek. Who knows why? There's no way a railroad could be there. <laughs> Probably back in the day, somebody was exploring a route and maybe that's why. Um, along the river is Holden Village, up on the hill is the mine. Um, so this is, entitled Wilderness Perspective. The mountains up the valley reposition their peaks on the horizon after glaciers melt. Flood and avalanche carve the slopes while tectonic plates work the depths. I walk the trail to check off that I came through, pretending my footprints or a branch broken off will be noted too, as God tends to the sparrows. But the mountains go on in their disregard for anything less than millennia. The wind stirs, leaves and dust blow across the trail behind me. If you think you're the center of the world, if you think you're really important, if you think that everybody should pay attention to you, go to hold it. And you'll have a perspective that helps. Fire is one of the things at Holden that is an obsession, if there is such a thing at Holden. You have to be obsessed by fire. Twice in the last two decades, 
the village has almost been destroyed by fire. And so every precaution is taken. They have their own fire department. They have their own fire chief. They drill regularly as to what happens if there's fire. No smoking in the village, no open flames in the lodges, nothing. The title of the poem is Fire. Clouds over the cascades and the weather report pinned up in the dining hall doors are not July. Black at night and blue all day are the only colors expected in the sky in any 24 hours of summer. But gray coming east this morning sends rumors through the village. Thunder speeds the talk of rain and lightning. Worry turns from heights postponed to what a fire. And at the start of lunch, there are reminders of what to do if evacuation orders come. But nothing is said of what it means if wilderness burns itself so red, the sky is gone. Um, the wilderness has to burn. It's part of its ecology. And there was no fire at Holden for a hundred years. And then the Wolverine fire in 2015 came that close. It was all around the village. The hotshot crews and a few of the staff from Holden were able to save it by that much. And so now when you go up the road to Holden, most of everything is burned until you get to about a quarter of a mile from the village where they back burn, they use sprinkling systems, they did all the things that you do to fight fire and around the village there's kind of a cocoon of still trees. And this is how most people this is the only way most people are able to express what they feel and see in the wilderness. The title of the poem is The Right Word. Do I dare use another paradise word for such a place as Holden? To be just more cliche about a million years of wilderness still clinging to the mountains? Even King James must have worried about Eden in translation. The dining hall is where I hear the word. When a little girl running through, holding wildflowers brought back from the day's height, shouts it over and over, look, look, look. And sometimes the wilderness gets in the way of the religious focus at Holden. It is a Christian place. You don't have to be a Christian to go there. You don't have to be a Lutheran to go there. You don't have to have any belief in anything to go there. In fact, many people who are there are not at all religious, except in terms of the wilderness. And they have some kind of spirituality, some connection to that. <clears throat> but every day there are prayers. Every night there is vespers. They're expected to be there. But the wilderness can get in the way of that. The title of this is Backsliding at Church Camp. <laughs> The rules expect attendance at Vespers, and you always follow the rules religiously. But here, the wilderness you came for is out there. And on your way to the village center where the gospel gathers, a deer on the road just past the last lodge turns and seems to say, come. Your hesitation is a 10 second prayer asking forgiveness and you go. At a turn a mile down the road, 
A sign that marks the start of a trail also seems to say, come. And you head up to a place among the trees where silence is unspoken parable. The first section of the book is coming in. The second section is look, look, look about the wilderness and how gorgeous it is and the effect that it has on people. <clears throat> and speaking of people, the third section tries to capture some of why people go there. Who is there? What kind of people are there? The best thing about Holden is that when families come, there are children. And after the last closure for COVID, when the village was closed for two full years, nobody came. They were very worried about whether families would come back because Holden depends on that sequence of the young couple takes their children who love Holden and those children go up and they want to take their children and on and on and on. Well, was anybody going to come after COVID? We were there in August and there were probably a dozen teenagers and there were probably 25 children, little kids. And if you want to understand what Holden is all about in terms of that, I sat and watched about a half a dozen 10 year olds, 11 year olds, nine year olds, playing with sticks. Remember when you played with sticks? You could fly on a stick. You could ride a stick horse. They were playing with sticks. And that's what happens at Holden. And this section is entitled Wilderness Pilgrims. And it tries to capture what happens as far as the people who go to hold it. There's a bell right outside the dining room. And every time anything is supposed to start, the bell rings. So if dinner is gonna start, the bell rings. If Vespers is gonna start, the bell rings. If there's a session on uh, environmental protection, the bell rings. If there's a fire, the bell rings. The bell rings all the time about announcing things that are going to happen. So the title of this poem is The Bell. There's also a grand piano at Holden, a concert grand piano. Have you ever seen a concert grand piano? They're huge. And we all wonder how in the world can a concert grand piano get to Holden and why is it there? And one of the reasons it's there is because music is part of the environment at Holden Village. And the music that has happened at Holden is truly remarkable. Some of the best musicians in the church come to Holden. Some of the most well-known musicians anywhere come to Holden and play music. And one year we were there, and how many of you remember the Prairie Home Companion? Okay. There was a fellow named Butch Thompson who was part of the Prairie Home Companion. And he was very, he's very famous. I don't know if he's still alive, but he was very famous in terms of playing jazz, playing the muse, the blues. And he came to Holden and put on a concert playing that grand piano. And it was just amazing. And part of what was really amazing is that he played the grand piano and a clarinet at the same time. <laughs> How do you do that? Well, you got two hands, one on the piano, one on the clarinet. And so the poem, The Bell, includes reference to that summer when we were there and Butch Thompson was there. The village bell is country church, town center, one room school, all day long, to remind us of everything from breakfast to vespers. Today, it brings a famous piano player in on the noon bus. His dress shoes and sport coat don't fit the gear of the village. His hair is city cut. He carries a briefcase. 
On the day's schedule, he is the evening concert. At dinner, he sits alone, and those who don't know wonder, is, wonder if he's from the board of directors. <laughs> After vespers, he waits off to the side, patience until the hymnals are put away. Those who stayed move to the back, best seats. A boy is told to go and ring the bell to hurry everyone back who may have forgotten or gone for ice cream. Someone announces who he is, and he sits down to play a different kind of sacred. In the audience, just arrived from Minnesota, grand piano, in the mountains, then ragtime. The big grand dances Fats Waller, Scott Joplin, Jelly Roll Morton, where we've heard nothing but hymns the past week. The third number in, a tapping feet can't help but pray along as he plays those keys into wildfire and roaring wind, avalanche, music rolling out the open door to celebrate the night, the same way a bell keeping time between sunrise and sunset rings true in the wilderness. The garden at Holden is uh, part of its fame. Um, it grows much of its own food. It buys local from all up and down Lake Chelan. Um, and it, it is truly a, a place of not only gardening, but meditation. And people who volunteer to garden, you can see them for an hour or two doing gardening, yeah, but not really. They're there for something else. Shadow of my father. My father is in the garden again. I assumed he was gone forever after he collapsed behind the tool ship and I finished school and moved away. Over the years, there has been no place for growing anything. It is work in big buildings. It is small city lots. Supermarkets are close by. Stepping into a row of rhubarb in the village garden where I come each day to volunteer, I kneel down the way he taught me, the same as in church. With the morning sun slanted on my shoulder, there he is, right beside me, as if praying for my very soul. As I said, volunteering at Holden is uh, the lifeblood of the village. There are staff who are paid and they're permanent, but to do all of the little things of garbage and housekeeping and cooking and all of those things, it depends on volunteers. And many volunteers who are there, as I have mentioned in, in the past here, are there to work at Holden, but also to work on themselves. Volunteers. There is no salvation in escape to wilderness after long walks in city parks have not been enough. Answers sought to hearken heaven out of isolation hold up only so long as the wind is gentle and the mountains keep to themselves. Prayers brought from home cannot be answered by animals on the way to high places up the trail. Other wilderness pilgrims can only respond by keeping the same loneliness to themselves. Here, the girl in laundry who comes out lesbian keeps her journal at night. 
While cooking, the widower daydreams about 40 years no more. Volunteers come for a month, for a summer, for a year, for the time it takes Holden to answer their prayers. So the first section is about coming in. The second section is about the wilderness that is so remarkable. The third section is about the people who are there and some of the things that they're there for. And the last section is called going out. And when you leave Holden, you usually are taking something pretty special with you. It may be something from the store, we bought a hat, but it's more likely something inside you. This is entitled Recycled Meditation. At a wilderness church camp, recycling takes a scientific name. But garbology, as it is called, is religion too. Boiled down to its simplest, we empty, we sort, we crush, we bag, we haul, we dump, we chop, we cover with sawdust and dirt. Can we help but flash back to childhood when grass clippings and weeds, canned peaches gone bad? and table scraps all went to compost behind the woodshed. When the world was grown-ups, the raising of children took chores, and the compost went right back into the garden rows staked with string. Recycling wasn't what we called it. Every day, the bring it in, cook it, take it out, dump it, turn and cover it was the way to make it with one job one car, one acre. It was the way we wasted not, wanted not. The way we helped God help those who helped themselves. Changing the oil every 3,000 miles, throwing change into a dish each day, putting wood in for the winter were the same. We did them religiously and learned they worked the way giving cider time to harden was chemistry. Now, 40 years later, when science and scripture both say the world needs saving, we come to the wilderness each summer where recycling makes good stewardship the way one acre of chores simply made good sense. Um, shirts are famous at Holden Village, T-shirts especially. Uh, People come with whatever their version of politics or religion or football or whatever, and they wear t-shirts. And so it's always interesting to read people's t-shirts and try to figure out what, what's going on with them. <clears throat> Title of this poem is Sometimes All You Can Do Is Just Wonder. T-shirts sometimes say more than sermons. That was the message. It didn't matter that there was a sermon. What mattered was that the girl giving the sermon last night at Vespers was talking with notes, but her t-shirt was going off into the space high up in the village center, the way fireworks go off in the sky 10 miles north, and you wonder what they would look like if you were right there. You want to see the last droop of fire into the water, we couldn't take our eyes off. Religion sucks sometimes too. Couldn't, didn't want to. We wondered what set off that kind of fireworks. <clears throat> Everyone gets to wear their version of politics or law or football. But religion? Was he just trying to be funny? She must have decided God has something to do with broken hearts or abuse, or mean Twitter. But the warm woman knitting in the first pew shook her head and speeded up. A little boy in the back wondered if you could say suck in church. And his mother, whose tattoo under a short sleeve showed something about love, explained with a hug. 
All of which leads you to just wonder what it would have said if Mary had been wearing a t-shirt on the way to Bethlehem. And I'm going to end with this poem and then give you a chance to uh, for a couple of requests. I tried to summarize um, everything in the last poem. Uh, the title is Go Tell It Down the Mountain. You've arrived, <clears throat> you've seen the wilderness, the people are there. The last section is about leaving. Go tell it down the mountain. When you get back to the real world and try to tell whoever will listen about Holden, tell them you spent a week in an old mining town, the Lutherans got their hands on it and made it into a place for holy talk, holy walk, and holy cow. Tell them you went thinking that without a TV or the internet, there would be nothing to do, but that you found excitement just being in one place every day, doing the same things with the same people. Tell them you went with all kinds of sessions, they were called, where deep thinkers got you talking about things like forgiveness, like service, like salvation. Tell them about the people you met and how six degrees of separation is more true than all the cliches they've ever heard. Because every day, someone in the village knew someone who knew someone right back to you. Tell them how glaciers and granite work together to grind beauty down to just standing there in awe at the overlooks on the trails along Railroad Creek. Tell them hiking is religious, not because it's such beautiful hiking, not because it puts you in touch with spirits told in Indian legends before God came along, but because it hurts so good to do it and treat it as pilgrimage in the wilderness. Tell them that never having been there before in one week, you learned again, but all those good Lutherans seem to know about places to visit when vacation is religion. Tell them there is rhubarb from the garden every day. Tell them kids run far into the night with their games. Tell them porches there are confession and communion both. Tell them that a prayer around the cross, strangers pray for strangers as friends. Tell them you raised your hand to volunteer for a dish team and laughed that the Holy Spirit made you do it. Tell them of the soft afternoon wind that cools the trail through the big trees. Tell the stories you were told about the old days when it was a college kid who saved the place. Tell the joke made in the sermon about Jesus that was still gospel truth. Tell them Holden hilarity is good for the soul. Tell how easy it is to speak up at book discussions when you haven't even read the book. And it's by a theologian who everyone in the room seems to have as a neighbor. Tell about the mountains and wilderness in tales as tall as the trees because Holden is as beautiful as any place this side of the promised land. Tell them at Holden you might find the Holy Spirit going to the end of the road in the middle of nowhere going to meals with strangers who are just as nervous about what to say as you, going to vespers every night and pretending it's songs you've never sung, going for hikes along trails that look down on nothing but down, going to sleep in a place so quiet, deer eating at the lawns in the morning wake you, going past the snack bar in the afternoon where if you stop, someone will offer to buy you ice cream going down the mountain and people sending you off with a wave goodbye that means every word of the prayers they've said for your safe travel home um you have a list in front of you if there's any poem that you would like me to read we have five minutes is that all we have And if you don't, that's that's fine too. Can you read Wilderness Song? <clears throat> okay. Um, I I wrote the poem, and I decided <coughs> to add the numbers of the verses 
So it looks like the Bible when you have a number of the verse. So this is Wilderness Psalm. It is the end of my last hike at Holden, and I walk back to the village for dinner. The trees that block the setting sun have hidden in the valley a hundred years. The wind has not reached them, and they are now giants. Fire has burned them and let them grow. Burned them and let them grow. Beneath them, the valley floor is full of undergrowth, tinder in the heat. The weather report has warned that with lightning, fire will again cut through brush and downfall like axes. This valley is more metaphor than I dare admit after this last week away from the money and malls of my life. I have walked this way to find the peace of mind now walking with me. The silence is a reminder of all that I came for, all that I have found. At home, I will tell of what wilderness teaches me and sing its praises. Yes. Thank you. Does anybody have another poem that they would like? We have uh, one minute. <laughs> I have several one minute poems. Uh, I decided to put at the end of the book, you know, when you've gone in, on vacation and you send a postcard home and it always says, wish you were here. Yeah. Well, this one, you've been home and you send a postcard back to hold. So it's entitled Postcard to Hold. Just a note to say thanks. Got back to the world yesterday. Unpacking, found a handout from a nature walk. Couldn't remember all the names of things along the way. Doesn't matter. Words everyone used on the talk tell it all. Green, unspoiled, remote, grand, serene, quiet. Peaceful, glorious. At every turn, a kid up front kept saying, holy cow, look at that. A place that needs its own thesaurus. Guy from Minnesota maybe said it best. God is beautiful. Might have been a prayer. Glad you're there. Thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate the chance to read after two years of not doing it. Do you go back every year? Do you go home every year? Well, we haven't during COVID, obviously, but from 2009 until COVID, we went probably every year or every other year. And uh, we went there in August. And we went back after they opened the village. Um, in May of 2021, 2020 was COVID vaccine that fall, they opened the village for summer of 2021. So we volunteered to go back with a whole bunch of people and clean the village. And boy, did we clean it. We cleaned every beam and every windowsill and everything because no one had been there and they were being ultra, ultra, ultra safe in making sure that it was good to go for the people coming. So we did that in May and then we went back in July, 2021. And then again in August of this year. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, we, have a we do have, I do have copies if you would like them. They're $150 each. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I have them for sale if you want them, but they're $15 and I, I have changed. So.